Good morning. <clears throat> Let me start off with a few comments about this, uh, what the book calls an application factor, and I've been calling it an impact factor because it's <clears throat> it is for bearing selection. Uh, <clears throat> this is based on experience. And when you get out and practice, they may well have an impact factor, you know, which you could get. Alternatively, they may not have one, and it may just be implicit in their safety factor. Okay. Uh, what you do in this class, This is in table 14.1. E.g. if you're told they have light impact, and a ball bearing, then this table gives you a range The light impact is 1.2 to 1.5, you would take the maximum. It's just a conservative approach. Okay. If you're given light to moderate, for a ball bearing, then you take, if you end up taking the same thing, you take the common common value, which turns out to be the max for the lower range. And likewise, throughout this table, if you're given heavy impact, you take three, if it's a roller bearing, you take two, okay? If you're told it's moderate to heavy for a roller bearing, you take 1.5. That gives you a, a rule here. This is what I would do in practice if you encounter this. Well, first of all, you can go on the internet and see if you can find out what any of these factors are for your particular mechanical engineering application. And, and the internet is, is a great source of data. But you may not find anything. You may end up no better off than what's in the book and you have ranges. Uh, and when you first get out, you, you probably meet with, with uh, an engineering, senior engineer in your area, I, I don't know, often once a week. You don't want to just call them you know, you met with them on Monday and then you start calling them on Tuesday to say, well, I don't have an impact factor. So you go ahead and make a decent, sensible uh, estimates rather than interrupt it. Now, some of these people will be very patient and it won't matter, but some of them are not. And they're doing other things they don't want to be interrupted. So go ahead and make a decision. Well, the way I've made decisions when I've had a range like this, let's suppose I had light impact. Then I would do the worst case, 1.5, and I do the median. Uh, 1.35, the middle value. And if it doesn't make any difference, then I don't really need to know much more, okay? If it makes a difference, then in the next meeting, you ask them, do they have an impact factor and, and what's going on? But for this course, just to fix ideas, just be conservative, okay? In practice, it's best to be conservative and representative, okay? Are there any questions on that? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, okay. I know we've been talking about the failure of these bearings, um, and I think we mentioned this at the very beginning, but the normal failure mode is that that inside ring will crack? Is oh, that what happens? There's this civil failure modes. You have maximum contact stresses beneath the surface in the races and also in the rollers and the balls themselves. Typically in the outer or, or um, race, you have lower stresses. The inner race has the higher stresses. So the typical way it, these things break is there's a crack forms below the, either the ball or the roller or a little floor there. And after a while, this piece comes out. Then you start the 
bearings start to make quite a lot of noise. And then you start to have, you know, you're running over chips of metal in, in the bearing and uh, pretty soon you need to replace it. It's going to start falling apart. So the, the basic failure mechanism is, is uh, that that shear stress beneath, that maximum shear stress that occurs beneath the contact in either roller or ball current, that goes backwards and forwards. The material gets tied, it's ductile, but then it becomes brittle. And then it starts, there are some tensile stresses, which we didn't discuss, but when the ball comes around, before it gets there, when, it, when the stress is going to press it, there's a tensile stress and that'll grow a crack and that little piece will come off. So this looks like this. So here, here's the race. The inner race. So a little crack forms it. There's some sort of rolling component, which, which in the case of a ball bearing will be in here. Uh, in the case of roller bearing more on the outside, but down here, a very it's very shallow, very, very shallow. Um, <clears throat> I've forgotten just what it is. It's a fraction of of the contact area, and the contact area is very small, but you don't see it initially. It's one of the re reasons why these failures are kind of sneaky. And after a while, this grows up and a little piece comes out. I've drawn a much bigger piece in there. And and you start to get little pieces in here. Well, that makes things start to shatter, uh, chatter, and, and you get a noise and you know that the bearing's going. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Now, I had another question. That's what I started off here. And that was, <clears throat> what about vibration? There's no vibration here. The reason for that is as follows. <clears throat> so here, put a bit of piece of rubber and I'm pushing a ball into it on top, I'm pushing up and down like that. Okay, I'm not sure which way you can see it better. That would be vibratory. <clears throat> the stresses that I'm producing by doing this are sinusoidal. So <clears throat> in that sense, they have a dynamic, excuse me, <clears throat> aspect, okay? But you get the stresses just from static analysis. You just go and get the contact stresses for a sphere, okay? You have, you have to have the moduli and the radii this, the radii for this is infinite. The radii for this is finite, obviously. This is this is relatively soft. This is going to going to give you most of the compliance. And as I push it, the stresses I get get here are just what you get from static analysis. So there's no impact factor for vibrations. Okay, typically. Now in, impact. I don't know how well you'll see this, but you can try it yourself. If I drop this on here, it'll bounce, and that means it's got a force that's several times its weight. Well, it's very hard to see. Okay, but you can try. So impact <clears throat> um, requires a, a delta V between uh, the particles. So there's no Ka. Now at the moment you make a statement like that, there, there could be exception. The exception could be the one I mentioned. And that is that the <clears throat> shaft is vibrating and somebody changes some of the surrounding so it starts to hit well then you'll have a delta v and then then you there, there would be an impact situation but you need under normal circumstances vibration stresses are found from static analysis and then they're just multiplied by sine omega t okay uh dr sickler yep for these uh application ranges if you put that table back up the ka yeah. table sure um Say you're designing something and space isn't necessarily an issue, and you're given a uh, you know moderate or heavy impact range. Would increasing your ball bearing size lower those uh, impacts to no no the, light? The, the, these are for all sizes. Okay. 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 Um, would it in fact? I'd have to know the nature of your impact better to tell you that. Okay, dynamic stress analysis is quite a lot harder than um, than static stress analysis. So most of the time we use static, and most most of the time static is, is is totally fine, like for vibration. Impact analysis um, would take a little bit of work to answer your question. Um, once you make it bigger, then the impact forces are going to get bigger, very very roughly. These ranges, as far as you're concerned, you just follow this, okay, and and don't worry about the size. But roughly speaking, the force—it's well, not roughly. This is conceptually 
is V. Let's go, let's make that clear. Delta V root M K. Delta V, when I dropped the golf ball on the piece of rubber, was its velocity coming in because the rubber wasn't moving. If you have two things moving in the same direction and one is moving faster, then that would be the delta V. And so the, it would go as the square root of the mass. So there would be some dependence. <clears throat> this is some stuff that you're supposed to get in machine design too. I don't know how much you got about this. The, uh, the book has a decent treatment of it, uh, you know, Duval and Marshall. Um, I, and, and you can find it in Marx. Um, I looked at these things and, and they, they basically do this. It won't, be, won't look as simple as this, but that's what they're doing, okay? They're not using momentum conservation. They, a physicist would do that, but they, they can be out by a factor of two, even if they can get the delta T. So uh, correct engineering analysis produces forms like this. I, I gave a series of notes. So if you're in capstone, it's quite likely you're gonna get these impact forces. And uh, Professor Gonte has a set of my notes that I wrote up after I looked at these two and thought they're kind of hard to read. Uh, if you're taught this stuff in machine design one, then the book is okay. okay. Marx is, is doesn't look like this, but really is, okay? And it's correct, okay? And the notes are just easier. And so you can get a copy from him if you get that. And what, is, what does the K represent? K, K is the stiffness. So, so um, yes, fair enough. Well, if you think of a boxer, the, the bigger the velocity of, uh, of the punch, the higher the force, okay? The bigger the guy's arm, the bigger the mass. And in K, the, the compliant member of this is the glove. And boxing had lots of people. <laughs> when I did a little bit of boxing, these gloves didn't have anywhere near the padding they have nowadays. And, and so what they've done to stop people getting <laughs> so many head injuries is they've increased the padding on the gloves and they've reduced the stiffness here. But, <clears throat> but the stiffer you make it, the, the harder the, the forces. But you're welcome to get these notes from, from uh, Dr. Gonte when you get to Capstone. There's nothing much to them. They're just sort of simple. I think they're simpler than, than uh, Juvenile and Marshak and Marx. Once you read these notes, you can read these rather easily. Let me recap Spur Gears. These are things that look like this and a distance. I'm not drawing this very carefully, but between the pitch point on this tooth and the pitch point on this tooth, that physical distance is P, the circular pitch. <clears throat> Are the various <clears throat> parameters to use to describe gears. This is arguably the most physical, clear pitch parameter. And P then is the pi D, the length of the circle, divided by the number of teeth. We have not covered exactly how this pitch point arrived at, but you can think of it as the point where you have the resultant force as contact moves down the tooth and back out again. Uh, it's actually got a geometric interpretation. That's not what's used. This is 
You can have this in inch and millimeters. You could use this for US gears or for, for uh, SI gears. What's usually used in practice in the US is what I gave you, P is N over D. This is called the diametral pitch. <clears throat> in here, I should have said. And this is the usual way gears are described in the US. <clears throat> so this is teeth per inch. So it's only tells you you've got a 16 um, pit, uh, 16 pitch uh, gear, they mean there are 16 teeth per every inch, which is pretty fine. Okay. That when you just give it a number, so they won't say diametral. Diametral means it's related to diameter, but they've just called it the pitch. And so if they say 16 pitch gear, they're, they're giving you this. And it means there are 16 of this per unit time. What I omitted to give you last time, which is in the homework, if you could look it up, I think easily. There's a corresponding thing for SI units is M. It's called the module. And it's in millimeters per tooth. And this is for SI units. And so you can relate these, and I did that before. We have this physical P or, or circular pitch time P. <clears throat> you can relate them since they share a common end and you get them equal to pi. And given that this P is one upon, <clears throat> one upon M, this means this is equal to P upon M. So if you're given M or you're given P, you can go get this P if you need it. <coughs> and we had some other relationships. In order to mesh, you have to have a common velocity at the point of contact, and that'll tell you that omega gear is minus omega P times NP over NG. Okay. That's for meshing. Somebody asked me, do you have a sign convention? Typically, dot, you, you can have a sign convention if you like. What you want to know though, is if you have a gearbox, does the, <coughs> In relation to the input shaft, what is the output shaft doing? Is it spinning in the same direction or the opposite direction? Every time you have a pair of spur gears interact, you get a change. So if you have an even number of pairs interacting, there is no change. But <clears throat> there'd be a minus sign to some power n where, where n is an even number. If you have an odd number, then there will be a change in direction. But whether you bother giving this a sign convention, um, it doesn't really matter. That's the key thing you're going to need to decide. <clears throat> the opinions are typically small and they usually drive gears, but you can relate, rearrange this, and you can have the gear driving the pinion if you wanted to speed something up. Okay. So the gear is going to spin more slowly because the number of teeth on the pinion is far less typically than the number of teeth on the gear. So it's going to go down by some factor. I also gave you some forces at FT and FR. And please call the pressure angle. And it, it's either well, typically it's 20 degrees, but it can be 25. The 
some time ago, there used to be some lower pressure angles, but manufacturers don't use them anymore, I don't think. And so what this looks like is if you've got a tooth, this is where the center is. The radial force always pushes in towards the center. And if this is turning this way, and it has an FT this way, this, this will be pitch point, so the resultant force is off at this angle like this. This FT, um, when, when gears mesh, at least initially, it can have more than one gear in contact, and in which case FT is the sum of the forces. And then as you go through contact, one of the teeth leaves, and the other teeth is in contact by itself, and so this FT becomes a force on a single tooth. And when it's starting to leave, another tooth comes in, and typically you have a couple. So this FT is the total force probably going to use to get torque. <clears throat> it's customary when you're designing uh, gears and you're looking at stresses uh, to, to just take FT as on a single tooth, which is the worst case, which happens, which happens. It doesn't happen all, the whole time of contact. So we get torque then. Is FT, there's no contribution to torque from FR, which acts through the, through the uh, center, times the D up upon two. And then the power, and I'm putting a hat on the power because we've got P in this section, uppercase P for the pitch, that's the most common symbol there, is just T omega. And as previously, you have to be a little careful with your units here, okay? If this starts to be in horsepower, then that's 550 foot pounds per second. This has to be in foot pounds, and then omega has to be per second, radians per second, radians of no units, okay? And this will often be given an RPM, so you have to change to radians per second. Then the, the efficiency is the power out, the power in, whoops, sorry. And it's typically high, more than 90%, right off of 95% for a single pair of gears. Now, as you start to have more and more gears interacting, then you get a product of these things. And so the overall efficiency can drop down. And I gave you one relationship for T out. So P out is E PI, and P is T times omega, then you're going to get E. So if the output gear is a gear, it's going to have more teeth than the input is an opinion, and so this is going to go up, but E will remove it somewhat. This is a magnitude only. You could keep track of the sign of this, but typically what people want to know is which way is the shaft spinning. Okay. <clears throat> but we, we could keep signs here if we want to. Well, let me return. The example I did at the end. Are there any questions on this? Yeah, so is the D in the torque expression you have, that's the diameter of the, the gear pitch. that's experiencing the forces, right? Or is that opinion? The, the D is the pitch diameter, okay? That, that's where this this key point is on the place of the, of the two, which is like the point where, you know, you have this contact Here's a tooth that comes into contact on the top here, and you have a contact stress, and the move, contact stress gets bigger, moves down like this. And if you take all of these stresses and resolve them, you get a resultant force at, at the pitch point. This is only true if you pick the shape of this tooth in a certain way, and you have to pick it as to be an involute in a circle to make this happen. Okay. And, and we haven't really covered that. But, but you can just think of the pitch point 
is, is where the resultant force acts. Okay. And then this has its own diameter to the center. That's the pitch diameter where this point is on the two. And that's what goes in here. Okay. What are those little teeth looking thing again? Sorry? What are those little teeth thing you drew? What this are those? Is These are contact stresses that move down. Okay. Okay. So yet you, you have a circular tooth contact with a circular tooth, then then you have the the sonic clip. And initially they're a bit small and then they build up and they move. So they, they've moved all the way down here. So where's the resultant force averaged over time? <clears throat> but at some point here, which we call in the pitch point, okay, and it's at an angle. Okay. It, it's not it's not uh, normal to the radial line. Okay. Okay. So this is not a very clear figure, sorry. But yes, the, the contact uh, stresses look like semicircles and they move down here. So you don't, <clears throat> this is when you first start having contact. Okay. It's a tip. And of course it goes back up again. Let me return to this example, that last one I did. So this is actually the first problem in the problem set. Oh, sorry, it's problem number six, problem set eight. And so I did the first part of this to help you with this problem. I'll do the second part. If, you, if you're very comfortable with what you did, then this should be easy for you, okay? But, and you, you've done well if you did it. We have done enough for you to get it right. But it's not, first time you do one of these, it's not that easy. And so we had, we had a reduction Set to look something like this. The, these gears are supposed to be the same size. I drew this more carefully last time, and this is the pinion. And this is a good sharp V. That's, and it's going to have some bearings. And so I'd like to go get the bearing forces because that's the first step in designing these bearings. And so let me draw this. Not a scale drawing, but this is the gear. This is the pinion. This is sharp B. And then given some units, some links. These were all in millimeters. This is quite common in, in uh, designing gears. When, when you design bearings um, by themselves, typically in the US, you've got Timken bearings and that's all SI units. But when you start to move with gears, you're going to have pitches for these gears, which are going to be the standard US pitches, but you may well have the sharp uh, lengths and millimeters. So, so a mixture of units is quite common. You need to be 
careful to make them consistent. So we had, we did a little bit of work on this one. We got T A, A was this sharp here, was 7.96 Newton meters. I checked that, right? so I think the arithmetic I did is okay. V was 25 degrees. We're going to give V as 25 degrees. I'm not sure if we did that or not. P, and this is US, is five teeth per inch. So there's your mixed two units. Okay. NP, well, this P will be the same and V will be the same for both the pinions and the gears, but NP was 15, and NG was 45. What we want to know is the bearing forces here and here. And that was included in your first problem. I, they didn't draw this figure, they, they did a much more careful figure here and put the units in there. I mean, we need to get these in order to design the bearings. These bearing forces are going to be uh, radial here and here. Okay? It's going to be a different FR from what we had over here. So we'll have to distinguish with that. That's a gear radial force. There'll be a radial force on the bearing. There'll be very little thrust here. So we could pick either roller or ball bearings here. But the first thing we need to know would be what the forces are. Since it's gearing, we could go take a Ka of um, 1.3, that would be the maximum from that sheet if we start using ball, or 1.0 for roller, which might be an argument for roller rather than ball bearing. And of course, we'd need to know, um, we know the RPM, I think, we need to know how long you want to run this thing, what sort of life do you expect to get out of this okay, to do, but the, which in order to do any of this, we need to have the bearing for it. There's a little bit of a shopping list of things we need to find to answer that question then. Well, we've got the number of teeth, but to start uh, getting torques and things like that, we're going to need to know DP diameter, the pitch diameter of the pinion and of the gear. Okay. Then we're going to go, have to go and get FR, or well, F, FT first, then, F, then FR. And once we get that, This is not the same as this FR. This FR is for the gear, this is for the bearings. Well, it's pretty simple to get NP and NG. DP, for example, P is NP over DP. And NP here was 15, sorry. Yes, NP is 15 and P was five. So this is three inches. But to be consistent with this and do the whole thing in millimeters and multiply by 25.4, so we get 76.2 millimeters. DG, DG, this diameter is uh, three times as big, okay? So this, this thing is three times as big, so DG is just three times 76.2, let's see what's that. Two, two, nine. DG would be NG 
over P and NV is 45, it used to be 15, so it's gone up by a factor of three. Now, <clears throat> we're gonna go and get these forces. Okay, well, <clears throat> where the maximum torque acts is on the pinion, the first pinion on, on shaft A. So that's the place to go get the forces because that'll be maximum. The torques will drop down because of efficiency later on. So we're gonna get, <clears throat> for B, we're gonna get forces from driven pinion on shaft A. It's important to use these efficiencies when you're trying to figure out how much power you're getting out and you don't, you don't want to overestimate the power. But if you're starting to estimate the forces, then don't get where your maximum torque is. And so we're going to have something here. There's going to be an FR coming in from this pinion and an FT. And I'm not too worried about which direction it is. I just know it's tangential. An FT from the pinion times DP That's TA, which we had. TA was 7.9 cents. So, so FT was 2TA over DP. We've got DP now. Okay. So it's 2 times 7.96. That's what it was in Newton meters. And DP is 76.2 times 10 to the minus three meters. Get 209 newtons. Then okay. FR would be FT tan phi Ten twenty-five, about point four six, drops us down to ninety-seven point four. <clears throat> can, you, can, you, can you explain again why you went from the driven pinion? Okay, if you you, you could do this for TV, this, this would be. Okay, so th that would be the corresponding formula, DG, okay? And, but this TB will have been reduced by, <clears throat> by I think we had 95% efficiency, it'll be 5% lower. So I'm gonna get a lower FT, 5% lower, that's all, okay? So to avoid that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, um, take the torque coming in from the pinion, and this will be a little bit higher. It's not a big deal, but 5%, that's, it's about 200 newtons if you, if you do it that way. Okay, so so when you when you start doing these these drive trains, uh, get your drive trains, use your maximum torque from the driven thing to get your forces. And then you can get all the other forces. I'll show you next how to get forces on on the next um, pinion on on shaft V. You can just get that from equilibrium. Okay, <clears throat> okay, so that this is just a little bit lower. But, but it's, it's, if, you, if you remove the efficiency, you would get exactly the same answer. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay.
But so doing this is not really wrong. It's just, it's just not as conservative as what I've done. Now, if I draw a shaft B, I'll sketch it. Then what we've got here is we've got FR, which we just figured out, and FT. There are some forces from these bearings here, but for this to be in <coughs> uh, maintained angular equilibrium, it's spreading steadily. So equilibrium is the right term, it's not an incorrect term. There's no acceleration when we're rotating at constant RPM. Then this on this pinion, this is the gear, an FT prime, but the pinion has to act back in the opposite direction. And these radial forces always act in towards the center of the gear. So if I take, if I balance moments, then FT times DG over two, which is the moment there, would be FT prime, the force on the pinion times its diameter, GP over two. So FT prime equals two is cancelled. And this is three. So if we want to work out, it'll be, it'll be 627 newtons. And now I can get FR prime, that's FT prime, and I have a common pressure angle, so tan phi, and that's this 25 degrees, which reduces by about a factor of two. It'll be three times this. Two nine two. Well, now we're sort of in a position to get the forces at A and B, the two bearings. And it, these forces are going to be due to FR, which is vertical loading. And then there's going to be some forces due to the horizontal forces, FT. And we'll do them one at a time. On the vertical plane, here's what my free body diagram looks like for shaft B. When, you, when you're drawing the free body there, it's optional whether you extend the thing out from where the force acts, but then the vertical plane, this force here would be FR, which we which we know. Ninety seven point four. And this force here is three FR. You can put in numbers if you like, but sometimes it's easier just to leave these things around so you're not carrying numbers along. Then these are both down, so you'd expect the reactions to be both up, but they're not going to have the same magnitude. Let me call this VA because we're in the vertical plane and VB. In millimeters. And we've done things like this before. I think the simplest way to analyze something like this is that, and I'll get VA first, like, Take moments about B, then BB is gone. I put these things acting up. If, if, if in this case, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the case, but 
Sometimes it's not obvious which way. You just put them in, and then the sign of your analysis will tell you whether you're headed or acting the right way or not. So VA, this moment arm about V is 100. That's the moment that way. That's the sum of the moments the other way. Well, this FR is a moment the other way. And its moment arm is 100 plus 25. But this thing here has a moment the same way. So this VA has a moment this way. I'm summing the moments back this way. It's going negative to that. So it's minus. And its moment arm is 25. There's 125 minus 75 is 25. So VA. Wouldn't that be 50? Sorry. Uh, should it be 50? It's 50. I meant to look at it wrong. Thank you. So VA is FR upon two. Now, now that I've got FR, I can just sum the forces vertically. And when I do that, I have four FR down, VA up is a half. So I have three and a half VA so FR down. So VB is three and a half or seven. It's not a bad idea then to take moments about A and check that these things work. This is not a new equation in the sense of being independent. This, this is 2D statics. You have two equations. Okay? You could have used this and this. You could have used this and this. You can use any two to get it. So this is just a check. And if you do that, you'll find that this works. Now we do the horizontal plane. Now here, let's say we call this FT. Then we got three FT, or well, we did a moment, equilibrium. And it acts in the opposite direction. Okay. Well, I would guess here that I'm going to call this HB because it's horizontal. HB opposes this three, and HA opposes this here. Okay. And they have the same same lengths. Okay. Now it doesn't really matter. You can put them both acting up, in which case you just get a minus sign for HB. Then now if we take sigma M. B equals zero. We have HA times the distance here, which is 100. And it's the sum, that, that's a moment this way. So some of the moments this way, well, these both produce a moment this way. This first one here is FT times 25. This is three FT. Sorry, I'm taking moments about V. I misspoke. This, I'm taking moments about B. This FT times this distance is 125. And there's a 3FT times 25. 125 plus 75, that's 200. So HA equals 2FT. Then if, if this was the Y plane, then this would be the X plane. HB, that's a force this way, is equal to HA plus FT, not minus FT. Plus three FT. This is two FT. So this is HB. It's 4FT. So now we can go get the forces on the bearings. 
Again, you could check this by taking moments about A, to make sure it works and, and it will. For A, we had BA with half FR. And uh, HA was 2FT. So the resultant force at A was radial, and I call it FRA. is these two squared and take the square root. Oh, I start the square. Let me not do that. We can put in numbers. If I was 97.4, And if T was 209, you had these numbers before. And I calculate that and got 421 newtons. For B, similarly, It's got a bigger vertical force and a bigger horizontal force. So you get a bigger, you substitute these in, square them, take the square root, I get 903. This is, this is predominantly due to this. This is about twice the force here. This is a relatively minor contribution, but it, it contributes. Okay, so it's a bit more than twice. But at this point, then you could you could do you could design bearing. You've got these radial forces. This wasn't asked for in the homework, but let me comment on this. And then we'll take a break. Once you've got F R A, that gets you the capacity for bearing A. You have a small impact factor. Uh, following our rule, you take if, if you pick four bearings, you take 1.3. If you took a lot of bearings, you wouldn't have one. So, uh, you need to know the life that you want. And we don't have that. But given that life, you could go get this. And likewise, you could get from FRB, you can get the requirement for bearing B. Then you go look at this list. And what you do is you pick the smallest bearing that has this requirement from each type of bearing, assuming you have option. Let's suppose when you're doing this, that the, these things came, let's suppose it came to 10 for bearing A. Then there's lots of bearings where you can get 10. <clears throat> with a bore of 70, you can get it even with a light load. Okay. With, with the uh, very light, with a light load, 200, you can get it with a bore of 55. And with um, moderate uh, medium load, you can get it with a bearing with 35. And there's likewise through these, through these lists, same or alpha, and actually roller bearings even a little bit less. Okay. And the roller bearing, these, these things will be a little bit different because of a different Ka. And so what you do is you pick Okay. Now, you, it may be Somebody may have told you we went roller bearings. Okay, in that case, you just look at the roller bearings. 
and you have three types of olive oil. But the, uh, and you pick the smallest one, and it's implicit that any bearing bigger than that will, will then work. Okay. And how do you decide which one bearing? Well, now you go and do the shark. So on some, one of your homework problems, I, I post the solutions on with, this is what happened. They asked you for bearings, and they didn't give you a sharp diameter, then report the smallest one. If they said, give me a 300 bearing that'll, that'll do this, then you pick the smallest one here. I, I arbitrarily pick 10. It would be 10.6. That, that would be 3 divided by 5, 307 would be. And it's implicit that all these other 300 bearings will do the job. Then you, then you have to get shaft diameter. To do the shaft diameter, you, you're going to go, the ultimate stress is going to be due to the bending, and the mean stress is going to be due to tau t. Okay, they're not equal, but, okay, but they, that's where they come from. Then you can get S effective. And you decide your end, and that implies your shaft diameter, D. And it's DS where you've turned it down to go into the bearing. So it's actually equal to D4. Because okay. that's that's going to be where the biggest stress is up. So we've we've gone through this sort of thing, and you you go size your shaft. So when you have a gearing set, you you uh, need to get after you've done your talk and analysis and, and you've analyzed your gears, then you need to go turn that into bearing forces. And the bearing forces will let you get options on bearings. Okay. And once that's the case, there'd be no axial here. So I think pretty sure a roller bearing would be just fine. And then then as it rotates, you've got these forces and you've got to go do a bending uh, moment diagram to get what sigma B maxes. And, and that's going to give you sigma A. Tau T is actually pretty simple. It's just the max on the outside tool along the shaft. That gets you sigma M, the, the average or mean stress. That gets you S effective, or you can go get the pick your safety factor from the Goodman diagram. And that'll tell you what you need for the diameter of your shaft. And that's really the smallest diameter, which is the core diameter. Now, th this was not part of this problem. I'm just telling you how you use this to put this whole thing together. That's why I think this is a good problem. So those of you who, who got, got everything down here and got it right, you're in great shape, but I'm put this problem again in the next problem set, problem set nine, which I'll also post today with some different numbers. So if you didn't manage to do this, you want to go through that and get it, then I'll give you the answers to that too. If you didn't manage to do it, it should be pretty quick just to update it for this. I, I haven't asked you to do this, but that's what you do in practice. Okay. That's what you do. Are there any questions on that? Okay, let's take a break for five minutes. It's really uh, raining here, seriously. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll take a break for five minutes and we'll come back and look at a different application. Hey, Dr. Singler. Yes. Uh, I don't know if this has been asked yet, but the um, final, is it going to be mostly uh, based on the stuff we learned after exam two? Uh, the simple answer to that is yes. Okay. But I will, I will go get to, uh, put together, last, look at last year's final and give you that as a practice final next Monday. And so, that, that's pretty, I haven't looked at it in a wee while. Um, that was in 2019. In fact, I'd forgotten I taught this class in 2019. That's so why I didn't give you practice test one from, from that. But practice test two was from, from uh, that 
that year and so the final will be from that year. That final will be similar to previous finals. The problems will not be the same, but it'll be similar in construction. And yes, it, it's weighted towards the, towards the start in the last few drop sets, but it, it is two hours, an extra half an hour. So I think one question from the earlier is not. But I'll, I'll get to see. And, and uh, I'll know the answer to that uh, for sure come Monday. And so, also, the syllabus says that we can have three formula sheets for the final. Yes, that's right. That's right. We're good. Okay. Um, and, and so that's correct. And so, some, if you look at what we're doing, these applications, what happened, you, you'll be given any tables, like that table with KA. If you have to use that, you'll be given that stuff. But it's a lot of lookup stuff. And, and when we started off today's lecture, there was quite a lot of formulas, you know, just, just to do spur years. And so, doing this application stuff, each application generates its own little set of formulas, plus there's whatever formulas you needed from doing other other aspects like contact stresses and stuff like that, which could be in this in this one. And so you can combine your, your uh, formula sheet from the previous step and then put put together a new formula sheet that has all the stuff for these applications. Because some of the stuff, I mean, some of it I know immediately um, from doing it. I've done it often enough, but uh, some of it, I would say, I wouldn't remember um, some of these formulas. Okay, well, perhaps, perhaps not too bad, but, but I certainly, I certainly wouldn't. If I was doing things, I certainly wouldn't mind having a sheet to check that I had the right formulas. So stuff, and you don't, you don't take time deriving it too. Don't have enough time to test the UI for this, so you want to want to have it there. But yes, I, I'll get I'll dig up last year's final, and if there's some stuff that that's there that's not appropriate because we didn't do it, you know, we lost a little bit of time. We had um, we didn't do much on curved beams, for example, uh, even though curved beams are quite useful. So that wouldn't, but it'll be what's in the problem sets. And so I'll, I'll remove anything that's not appropriate and show you last year's final. And, and for that matter, if you've got questions about the final, um, the next week you can ask them during class so everybody can hear the answers. And so if you've got some questions, further questions, by now I'll be happy to answer. Well, let me do it. A further application, the last application we're going to do. This is called power screw. This is in Juvenile Marshak, section 10.3, in both editions. A car jack is an example, or can be an example, of a power screw. That there are different ways of making car jacks. But you turn something, and then your car moves up, and the force you're supplying to uh, lift the car is nowhere near the force it would take to lift the car. So that's why it's called a power screw. Same thing here. Here's a C-clamp. And let's see. If I start. Right, we'll, we'll figure this out later today. If I start turning this, the force I supply here is, is a fraction of the force you get out of here. So that's what the name power, okay? Uh, actual fact, it's a bit of a misnomer. It, it, it's what they're called, but the power you get out, because these things are not that efficient, is not actually equal to the power you put in. But, and it's the same thing as 
people at gyms who got tired of lifting. What does that really mean? Strength lifting. So mechanical engineering make the same mistake. Now, power lifting would really be you take the weight that you're lifting and you multiply by the velocity. That's the power. Okay. Uh, whereas most people in power lifting would tell you it's how much they lift, not just the force. Now you could make some money by going to the gym and challenging the biggest guy there to a power lifting contest. Let's take half of what you bench press and move it up there in a flash, and the power you'll generate will be much faster than slowly lifting a big thing. I'm not sure I'd recommend doing that, but anyway. So, so this is a wee bit of a misnomer. But what, what's true is, is if you think about power lifting, the force I'm getting out here is much, much bigger than the force I'm putting in here. We're going to go check that out. Okay. So, so the why, well, the first thing is mechanical advantage. The force in is much, much less than the force out. And this is a big plus. Okay. Actually, there's another advantage to these things. They're precise. The C-clamp, when you rotate it, and we'll check this out, when you rotate this thing, it moves a precise amount each time. But the other example of something which is precise is my chromatic screw gauge. Um, well. You turn it, you're not interested in power out of my chrome, you turn it and you get very precise. Measure. And because it's very precise, you can measure things very accurately. So this is a big plus. The disadvantage is that they're inefficient. Which really means the power out is a fraction of the power in, okay, despite their, their name. Okay. And, and so you, <clears throat> This is not good. What you want to do is avoid rapid repeated use. It, it may be in, in designing some advice, you have to have these things operate quite often. Okay, but if you can, and the two examples I've given you, like your car jack. You hope not to use that for a whole year, okay? Or maybe years. C clamp we use occasionally. Micrometer screw gauge, the amount of power you're putting in and out of this thing is, is negligible, and so it doesn't really matter. But these things you all use sort of with a one time off kind of application. That's predominantly what they're using. That's not to say you can't live with doing them uh, more frequently. You can if you have to. There are occasions when we do. So let, let me <clears throat> just start analyzing these, talk about the geometry. It might have been a bit of tooth showing up there. These teeth, obviously, on an angle. Let's see. If I line up, you can see that the. Thank you, maybe you can. 
but the, this is, well, it's hard for you to see. Yeah, but these things are on a slight angle, they're a thread. So there's an inner diameter, which is called the root diameter. And then there's an outer diameter, which is the diameter of, to the outside of the threads. And so DR is the root diameter. And where's D is the major diameter. And when somebody talks about a, a C clamp, for example, usually they give you the major diameter. The pitch is the pitch. If you have N teeth per inch, And P it was one upon N. And with this system in the US, I'm pretty much sure everywhere, right hand thread or, or clockwise moving advancing the thread is the normal positive sense. Okay. You can get left hand threads where you <clears throat> where um, you rotate it counterclockwise to advance the thread, but for the most part, you're gonna be a right hand thread. What do these teeth look like? So not right hand threads is another way of saying clockwise positive. Well, let me do the simplest possible first. It's not used that often nowadays, but you do have square teeth. And as has suggested, they look like this. This is some sort of cross section of the Then in terms of the pitch, the square tooth, <clears throat> the pitch would be from here to here. The tooth takes exactly half of it. And the depth of the tooth is likewise, hence the name square, P upon two. That's basically, how an Acme thread works, which is the most common thread. The Acme standard thread does something similar to this. It just has sloping faces. So it looks like this. And if you get to the middle of the teeth, then this is P upon two, just like the square two. And the depth continues. 
EP upon two. So the only difference is you've got this sloping angle, I'll call it psi, and psi is 14.5 degrees for the acne standard curve. So it's just this thing and what you've done is change things like this. That's what you've done. Well, if you have a single thread either of either of these, then when you rotate it, it advances one P. So the lead L Most of the time you're dealing with single threads, they're called single threads. In which case L equals P. That's exactly how much it would move. When, when you rotate this thing around, it comes back up here and it's moved P. Okay. If you have double threads, which are not that uncommon, This is the default. If the people don't tell you what the thread is, it's a single double thread L equals 2P. You get more motion. Then there's a lead angle. I'll use the same notation as the book, I'll call it Lambda. Now I tried to show you this. Oh, oh, here we go. Well, I don't know how well, I can see this very clearly, but I, I'm not sure how well it's showing up on the screen. But if I line up this ruler with the thread, you can see it's sloping. It's, it's not 90 degrees to the edge of the paper will be there and it's sloping. So that, that's the angle we're talking about. Let me see if I can sketch that. It wasn't too clear when I, when I put that up there. And so if we, this is the root diameter. Then the thread, I'm, I'm just going to sketch it, wraps around this like this. There's another one here. If you do a tangent at the midpoint, then this angle here is lambda. If we have a single thread, Then we can get this lambda. Tan lambda, the tangent of that angle, is this distance divided by this distance. Well, for this whole triangle, this distance here is, <coughs> will be dm. dr is to the base of the thread. Uppercase, uh, lower than this. D is the outside of the thread. So the mean is dm. And so <coughs> The length of this thread is pi dm, and the amount advances is L, so tan lambda equals L over pi dm on average. dm We need this angle if we're going to start working out torque versus um, load relationships.
mechanical advantage. Well, let me do an example. For the C-clamp, I've got this as a single Acme. And I measured this at home before we came in. This is a bit over half an inch is outside. So I got the D. I wouldn't say this is super accurate, but I think it's reasonably accurate. Normally you get this from the manufacturer, but I've had owned a C clamp for years. I have no idea who the manufacturer is. And DR, that was harder to measure. I think the nearest 30 seconds was 15 over 30 seconds. 15, 30 seconds. A little bit less than half an inch, but more than half an inch. Uh, psi, it's a standard acme thread, it's 14.5 degrees. And here's what we'll figure out. What is the P, what's the lead, and what's lambda. Well, the P, if you think about it, This was P upon two. P is also the distance between points on two, but these, these Acme threads have a depth of P upon two. So P upon two equals this distance minus this distance, that's D upon two minus DR upon two, or if you like, P is simply D minus DR. That being the case, it's 5 eighths, 15, 30 seconds. If I make this um, 5 eighths, what is that got, symbol I, to the left of 14.5 degrees? What is that symbol? That's degree 14.5. That's psi. That, that's the angle. Okay. That's the angle of the, of the uh, inclination of the faces in an acting standard thread. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the book might use phi. We, we've just finished using phi for the pressure angle, so I wanted a different symbol. But uh, this is not the pressure angle. And so if I bring this to a common denominator, uh, 32, 20, 20 minus 15 is 536. So the lead. A single thread is five thirty seconds. We can see if, if this works. With this. If I did four four turns, then I should get four times the lead would be five eighths. Let's see if that if that works now. This uh, wobbles a bit, so I'm going to mark where the top of the thread is. And then we'll give it half one and the half two. That was not good. <laughs> no, 
Right. Well, I'll have to start again. Sorry, I screwed that up. Let's try again. One. Oh, hard. One. You could hang the handle off this part of the table. Yeah, I'm trying, trying to do that. It's not quite as easy. Two. Three. It's moved up, so it's in. It's, uh, okay, I've got four. Right. But, well, I didn't do that that well. I did do this at home and I had a more comfortable. It's a one, two, three, four. It's a little bit over five eighths. It's not bad. But it, it, if I could do it well, one of the things you'd, you'd see from this, it is pretty precise. Okay. Now, the, what's perhaps not so precise is I measured this as best I could with a uh, vernier caliper and took the angle into account but i'm not sure i got that precisely right normally you get these things from the manufacturer you get them very precisely but and, and once you have these things precise then you will get a uh, very precise motion very precise so this sort of work but not great and we can go get what Lambra is. So L is five thirty seconds. And DM um, the mean here, this would be 20 over 32, 15 over 32, 35 over 64. Let's see, five tenths of seven. So lambda is small. This is less than 0 0.1, 5.2. So the angle that I was trying to show you of slope is not that big. Well, what we want to get out of this stuff, are there any questions on that? What we want to get out of this geometry is <clears throat> how much force do we have to put in it for what, how much force we get out, and that's a, a torque load relationship. So here. Let's say this is the driven screw thread. It's the one we're turning. And then at this part here, you have a host thread which doesn't move. And we just figured out that these are inclined at an angle lambda, five degrees, probably not that order. So if I do a little chunk in here and blow it up, The 
I might have been better to switch these two because this thing is, yes, let, let, me, let me do that. When I draw my little thing here, that needs to be on the driven thread. Then I'm providing, well, first of all, this thing has some sort of load on the top. And so, lowercase w, So this would be a very small fraction of W. Then I'm going to provide, let me call it Q. So I'm providing a force. When I when I turn this thing, I turn a, a lever, but that provides a lateral force inside. I'm just going to call that Q now. Then there'll be some normal reactions here. Oops, sorry. I've got a prime on that, and I'll show you why in a minute. And then this thing would tend to make this thing move up the surface here. So the friction force would oppose that. The friction force is Fn. N is the total normal reaction. And F is the of friction. What's the difference between N and N prime? If I look at this thread this way, this is this angle lambda, which is here. But if I turn and look at it, look at the thread here, then there's a little slope this way, and that's the acme thread slope. And so if I sketch that, when I'm looking here, then there's a, a total normal force N, which is normal to that. But this has a slope. This was the angle that somebody asked me what it was, Xi, okay. Then N prime, this is N, this is N prime. It's the component of N that opposes the force W, so strictly vertical. So this is Psi, this is Psi, so N prime, it was N cos psi. Well, now I can go do equilibrium of this little element. And so I can take the sum of the forces in the x direction and put them equal to zero. And that's going to get me a relationship between Q and N and N prime, okay, which I can make Q 
called Q and N. Then I'm going to take the sum of the forces vertically, make a relationship between W and N and N prime, N to N. And then from these two, I'll be able to get a Q versus W. And then if I go get the torque, I'll be able to get the torque versus W. So similar to FX equals naught. Q is acting this way. W has no component on the horizontal. It's opposed by N, okay? This angle here is lambda. So Fn, this angle here, this alternate angle, this angle is also lambda. So it's Fn cos lambda. And then it's, this angle here is lambda. This angle here is 90 minus lambda. Cos of 90 minus lambda is sine lambda. And I can trade n prime n for n. n is a common factor then. I can do similar f y equals naught. Well, now it's going to be w. And n. This angle here is lambda, so it'd be n prime cos lambda. But this actually acts in the same direction, so it's minus Fn sine lambda. And I'll trade n prime n again. So I get n cos xi, that gets the n prime cos lambda minus F. So now I can get n in terms of w and substitute in here. A little bit of algebra. So this gives me n. Or W. And then I can substitute for N in here. I'm going to put the F's second. So I'm just going to change the order here. So I have cause. I can divide top and bottom by cos and I'll get tan. Which is what we got before we had the tan lambda. Well, torque is all these Q's, you add them all up, and the radius is going to be this mean diameter divided by two. And so sigma Q would be in sigma W, all of these added up. I didn't do that, that's not right. Sorry, I divide through by cos. That, that's an algebra right here. Sigma W.
the sigma w is the total force. So this is a torque force relationship. It's more customary to substitute for tan lambda. We had tan lambda with L upon pi dm. We can substitute that and get L and multiply across by pi dm. And here's an alternative form. This is the most standard. That's going to give me an L. And I'm going to multiply top and bottom by pi dm. This is going to give me an L and I'm going to for pi dm. This is loading up. And for the C clamp, we, we know all, all these um, factors here. So we can get T versus W. And we'll, we'll go get what T is. T, T I've got a little, uh, about a three inch arm. So T is gonna be F times that. And we can see what the, what the uh, mechanical advantage is. If you have unloading, then we're gonna turn it the other way. And friction opposes motion, so in effect F, goes to minus F, we have minus T. There's a change in the sign of the two F contributions. This becomes negative in the numerator and positive in the denominator. That becomes plus. So if I got a minus here, let me multiply three by minus one. That puts this friction term front. I put both the friction terms up front. Well, there's an aspect of this. Uh, Dr. Sinclair. Yes. What is that symbol right next to the little f? on the bottom of the equation? If L, this is now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry if the right is not clear enough. And the one you just boxed, uh, the bottom right, that's cosine, keep going to, yeah, right there. Cosine Xi. Right there. So what, what this thing says then, if you want, to have to apply some torque to unload it, then that's a good thing because that means it's self-locking. It means it won't start going backwards unless you apply a torque. 
true and t greater than naught. Well, what does that mean? It means that this has to be greater than this. For example, for the C clamp, L upon pi dm was what we calculated earlier. Size from an Acme thread, it's 14.5 degrees. We actually got L upon pi dm was tan lambda. And we calculated that it was tan. Tan lambda was two over seven pi. So you would need F. Cars of 14.5 is very close to 1.97. So you don't need much friction to make these things self-lock, okay? When, when Acme chose this thing here, this relationship gives them a self-locking um, uh, thread okay. if they have F bigger than this. Now, this we did this all for Acme, okay? You can do some of the thing for square, which is a little bit different. Well, we'll return and look at the efficiency of this stuff, and then we'll do some examples and look at some stresses in these, these power screws and see um, what, what you need to do to design them. And so that, that'll do it for today, but is there any questions? Is that 0 0.088? Yes, if you like, approximately 0 0.1, okay? So you don't need much. Now, I went online and looked at the manufacturer uh, of a C-clamp, as I said, I, this thing says pony. I, did, I didn't go find them, but I found a C-clamp and it was, had a half inch diameter, very similar to this. And they gave a coefficient of friction of 0 0.12, which would meet this. Okay. And so, so it does lock. So if I stand this up vertically, which you can't see, but it, it, won't, it won't come down under its weight. But you have, you have to turn it to bring it back. On the other hand, We'll, we'll find out that this coefficient of friction, you know, if the friction coefficient of friction is zero, then the thing's 100% efficient, of course it doesn't lock, but, but as F goes up, then you, your efficiency drops off. Any other questions? Dr. Sinclair. Yes. I have a question about the C-clamp example 32 you did. Example 32? Oh, okay. When you when you calculated the um, lambda, you put tan lambda is equal to L over pi dm. Yes. But I think your uh, mean diameter you didn't divide by two. Oh no, thirty five point six under sixty four. I think it is divided by two. Let's check. It's a fair question. Let's just see five eighths. And 15 over 32. If I bring this order to a common denominator of 32, uh, 
that'll be four, five, it'll be 20, plus 15 over 32. That's uh, 35 over 64. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Fair question. Bro. Any other questions? Okay, well, I didn't get quite as far as I hoped to here. Um, and with problem set nine, you know, hopefully we get everything done so you can do it. But if we don't, okay, I, I don't believe in teaching too much new stuff. Uh, we're certainly not going to teach new stuff past Monday of next week because the finals in the following Monday. So that gives you a little bit more time to absorb. So um, we, we'll see where we get to. And, and uh, maybe that I remove a problem from problem set nine if we don't get that far. Okay, Dale. And I will bring this uh, practice final or, or have this practice final uh, by Monday too, and I can answer questions and I'll get posted on, on next Monday. All right. Have a good day.